This week has been a, a very difficult week for this country. Today is Memorial Day. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you. Today is Memorial Day, and today we honor the men and women. Uh, if you can give that. Today we honor the men and women that have given their life for this country uh, in, in wars past, even, even in recent times. There are military men that are engaged and women in exercises where something goes wrong, a helicopter falls. Uh, in our most recent war for many years in Afghanistan, uh, Iraq, uh, before that there were men, veterans like my wife's uh, father who still lives that they were part of the Korean War. There's very few about uh, left in the Vietnam War, maybe a handful uh, that were part of the Second World War and even part of First World War. But Memorial Day is when we celebrate the fallen. Uh, those that have fallen, Veterans Day is we celebrate folks in the military that that have, um, you know, basically dedicated part of their lives to being part of our armed forces. And, and folks, I'm a big, big, um, I embrace the spirit and, and the, the greatness of this country. I'm a great patriot when it comes to the armed forces, our, our men and women in uniform, first responders. How many say amen and we thank God for them? Let's give them a clap offering. If you're some of those men and women here, we want to pause and we want to honor you in this day. And then for those that have fallen, and I say this just in a little bit of jest, um, you know, there was a, a boy that was coming into a, a different church, not this church, but, but there were some pictures of, of men who had, uh, had died in, in the service, in the service. And so he's about 10, 11, he's trying to understand what is happening. And so the pastor was explaining, these men have died in the service. And the boy asks his dad, Dad, what service, the 9 o'clock or the 11 o'clock service? He just wants to avoid whichever, whichever service where it was like they died. He didn't want anything to have to do with that service right there. And I pray some of you don't die as a result of this service. Um, I, I pray. But I, I want to shift a little bit toward a more, much, much more sensitive and serious and solemn, I would dare say, sacred moment. And um, this week has been a really tragic week for the community of Uvalde, Texas, and uh, this country in general, there's a stain uh, that is really hard to erase uh, from the psyche, the mind, the soul of this country. Every time that there is a senseless act of uh, violence, when the enemy takes somebody's mind, somebody that's been broken, um, and not too long ago in a, in a, you know, in a, at a particular, in Philadelphia, in a particular mall, uh, several people lost their lives, and just just you can kind of trace it. Uh, it's it's been coming more and more of an uh, not just episodic, but but an epidemic of just a senseless, uh, cruel, uh, raw violence. Somebody trying to make a, uh, a name for themselves. Somebody who's broken inside, soulless, if you will. Uh, the enemies twisted their mind, um, and they engage in acts of violence of this nature that are really, really tragic and that bring this country uh, to a different uh, state of mind of, uh, I pray, spiritual sobriety. Um, I pray uh, that we all pause. And so what I'm going to ask to do that, we're going to engage in a moment of silence for all those children's families that, that, um, that died uh, this week in Uvalde, Texas. Um, I know Uvalde. I have a few, a couple of relatives in, in, the, in the valley, in the Grand uh, Rio Valley. And uh, it's, a, it's a devastated community. Our, our, our police force was like, for whatever reason, paralyzed. Uh, there was a moment perhaps of just uh, decisions that, that it's easy for us to be Monday morning quarterbacks and, and double, you know, g double guess or, or second guess somebody. Uh, but I pray that, that they need prayer. The families need prayer of the fallen. There's a couple of women teachers that gave their lives in uh, to rescue and try to save some of those children. Let's pray for the family of the perpetrator. Um, they're broken. Uh, they're a broken community, a, a broken family. And today we're going to speak about how to heal, how to, uh, we've been talking about dysfunction and, and brokenness in marriages and families. And today I'm going to ask the Holy Spirit to help me, help us, help you, help me together uh, to kind of Figure this out. If, if, if life is a, if, if life is a um, labyrinth, and it is, I pray that the Holy Spirit would lead us and that we will not get stuck in a particular phase or stage uh, in life. That, that whatever traumas you and I have gone through or suffered, whatever 
uh, has stumped you in the past, whatever pain you've experienced, whatever shame you're carrying today, I pray that that's not the end of your story. I pray that the Holy Spirit today would just allow you to, to be circumspective, like to look inside and allow the Holy Spirit to entrench his power. Somebody once said and, and said, Pastor, you, you don't know how deep my wounds run, my, my deep, how deep they run. The abuse that I've uh, experienced, that I've, that I've needed to survive, how much I've been hurt. And then the Holy Spirit just spoke to me and says, tell her that my blood runs deeper than her wounds. That my blood runs deeper. That no matter how deep and how raw and how frail and how my blood and Calvary runs deeper. And I can still heal the brokenhearted. I can still heal uh, people that are hurt and maimed in their spirit and their heart. Uh, shamed because of what has happened to them. There's going to be some images that we're going to have here on the screen so we can put names to faces of some of the victims of this week's tragedy in Uvalde, Texas. Would you just uh, see them with me? So we're going to pray for their families. The, the survivors sometimes suffer worse than those that have you know, gone on to be with the Lord. And so there's Lila and a few others, as you see, Miranda and Navea Bravo. Let's just kind of, in your mind, just let's already begin to pray for their parents their grandparents, they had, some of them had brothers, sisters, aunts, uncles um, that are devastated. Right? Just, just wondering where was God. And so i just like for you to take a minute here, this church. For those of you online, we want to welcome you. Um, Wasco, uh, Delano, Coachella Valley, Tijuana. Uh, we're so grateful for you as well as we uh, take a moment to... Um, to contextualize and then compartmentalize um, what's happened and uh, to pray for, the, for these families, uh, these two teachers, um, the perpetrators' families, the, the police force, the community of Uvalde, Texas. Let's pray. Father, we're so grateful as we take a moment just to reflect on what's happening to this country, and not just through senseless violence, but in other areas of our country, in the higher echelons of, of power, all the way from the White House and Congress and uh, the Supreme Court, there is, a, there is a upheaval. There is a spirit that is trying to undermine the greatness of this country, uh, the foundations of this country. And I pray that the church rises up. I pray that all of us would rise up Every single one of us in our lane, in our area, in our phase, in our life, in our devotion to you, in our attendance to a church, um, trying to reconcile being salt, salt, um, being light in a dark world. And I just pray that the churches all over this country would rise up, men and women of integrity that would begin to serve in their local communities and, and serve in the local churches and say yes to opportunities uh, to, dust, uh, uh, to dust ourselves off and clear the cobwebs, the spiritual cobwebs of just being sedentary, just, just being uh, just, just observers and church attenders if we come or when we come, just being active. Father, I pray for all of these families, all of them. I pray that the Holy Spirit would go and comfort those parents, those grandparents, siblings, cousins, aunts, and uh, uncles, that community, that police force uh, that is under a lot of scrutiny, uh, those leaders in that community, uh, for those that are intervening, Father, we just thank you. Even for the perpetrator's family, we, we pray, Father, that they would find you, that they would find rest, that they would find healing. You love them as much as, as the families that fell victim to the senseless act of, of violence and just horrendous, just morbid. It just, just words are, are not enough to explain the degree and the, the nature of this tragedy. Like others in, in Philadelphia and others that came before that, but we, we pause this moment, uh, this, this day and this moment as a church to reflect, to be introspective, to ask the Holy Spirit of the living God to not only 
through your wings of healing. As, as Micah, the prophet, says that you bring healing in your wings for that community and those uh, family members, but also to this church. A moment of sobriety, a moment of um, introspection and circumspection so that we would rise up and become the church that you've called us to become without, without delay to the glory of God. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, and God's people say amen and amen and amen. Let's give the Lord a clap offering and, and just let's trust God that, that, um, that God is doing something that, that goes beyond the pale even of our own understanding. If you guys help me, I'm going to try and be very brief. I think if Pastor George and Sister Narce are, are watching, I thank Pastor George. Uh, he's a man of God. I love the way Pastor George preaches. Um, and how he just comes and brings the word. So I want to thank God for Pastor George. How many say amen for Pastor George? He was here last weekend. I did notice that he hurt two or three of you, and I've come to heal you in Jesus' name. I, just, I took note of that. I want to appreciate Marcos and Flora Martinez. They're visiting us for the first time. Let's hear it for Marcos and Flora. I'm not going to embarrass them. But they got here early, and I, I just I went to say hello to them. And I said, uh, you know, and I hadn't seen him. So I said, do you guys, have you guys come? No, this is our first time. Great. I go, do you know the pastor of this church? He says, no. I go, I like him. <laughs> He's my favorite guy in all the world. I told him, you're going to enjoy this preaching, his humor. If it comes natural, you'll enjoy it. So I just want to welcome them and appreciate them uh, today uh, in Jesus' name. I'm going to see if I can. I don't know if this moves or not. But it's kind of, it's okay. We'll work with this here. Um, daring to connect. That's what we've been talking about is it daring to connect the broken pieces, uh, those, those joints that are disjointed in our lives, especially relationships. At the end of the day, it's the three R's, people, three R's. That's what life is all about. Relationships, relationships, relationships. If your relationship with God is not right, whole, and wholesome, if it's not healthy, then it doesn't matter. Anything else, everything else doesn't really matter if your relationship with God is not in right standing, period. No ifs, no ands, no buts. It doesn't, everything else is already stained, already is compromised. If your relationship with God is not in place, it's not in order. If he's not your savior, your Lord, and your master. Secondly, if your relationship with yourself is not wholesome. If you're not good with yourself, then nobody around you will be. So if you're not at peace with yourself, if you don't accept yourself, if you don't love yourself, if you don't forgive yourself, if you don't uh, embrace who God has made you, who you are, the good, the bad, and the ugly, but you need to uh, be healthy in your own relationship with yourself and be working on yourself over and over, then your relationship with your spouse. If you're married, there's no more sacred, no more uh, um, uh, solemn and serious relationship if you're married than your spouse. Uh, nobody other than Christ is more important. Uh, nobody should be seen or you should see nobody more like what you should see your spouse, your husband or your wife, the way Christ sees him or her. Redeemed with potential, with greatness in or her, and, and not through the eyes of the veil of human eyes because you're going to be compromised when you see somebody uh, through your own filter. Uh, you'll, you'll feel anger and hatred and and there'll be all kinds of divisive issues that'll destroy the nature of your relationship if you're not capable of seeing your wife or your husband the way God sees them. Uh, they're not perfect. They get underneath your skin. Sometimes you want to kill them. Sometimes you have attempted to kill them. But they've survived, unfortunately. They're here. Now what do you do? Uh, and then relationships with others, relationships with relationships. The, the second R is resources, but we won't talk about that today in terms of making your life count for eternity, your relationships, the resources, your time, your talent, your treasure, your temple, uh, your testimony, and your tongue, life and death, the way you talk, the way you speak. You can encourage or discourage. You can uh, um, lift somebody or you can destroy somebody, encourage somebody. Uh, so that's your resources. And then the third R is responsibilities, your titles. Uh, you're a son or a daughter of God. Your responsibilities, you're a husband or a wife. You're a son or a daughter. You have a title at work. You have a responsibility at home. So it's relationships, resources, and responsibilities. And, and in that order. But today I'm going to talk about reconnecting. Reconnecting for healing and family conflict resolution. Reconnecting for healing 
and, and family conflict resolution. And I, I pray that you see this to, for what it is and, and what it is. So I'm going to talk really soon about root causes for the dysfunctions. What are some of the root causes? But before that, I just want to share with you that I am, uh, uh, just know that there's, this series is important for all of us. It's important for all of us because at, when it's all said and done, your decisions and the spirit behind those choices uh, are everything. So the choices, you are what your choices say you are, period. You are what your choices say you are. The choices in the past, the choices that you're making right now, and I pray the choices that you will make in the future. So how do you make better choices? You need to become a better person, somebody who's more sanguined, somebody that's more contemplative, somebody that's more balanced, more like Christ, more mature, Somebody that takes, uh, puts aside the past, the hurt, the pain. If not, all your choices will be done through the prism and the filter of pain and disgust and anger and bitterness. Uh, because so a man thinketh, that's what he is, the Bible says. So it's incredible uh, that if I, when you ask somebody, most everybody, hey, how are you doing? Almost everybody says, oh, I'm doing great. They put on immediately a facade. A pr they project uh, uh, something that is not true because most of us are not doing great. Some say, oh, I'm doing pretty good or better than ever, somebody dare say. Better than ever, that's like, like a lot. Uh, better than ever. But we do that as immediately to, as a shield to deflect attention. Because uh, so, most of us walk in denial about the reality of our home life, of what happens at home, what is happening right now, uh, our relationships, how healthy or how uh, how um, infirmed are they? So most of us are in denial and walk uh, and talk uh, and we deny and we don't want to talk about the real issues, our real family struggles, our family fights, our wars, our battles. The reason we don't want to is to address them is because we've tried in the past and we failed miserably. I don't doubt that all of us have tried to get a better relationship, uh, come to a better understanding with our wife, our husband, with our children that sometimes uh, end up very angry and uh, they disappoint us. So what does a disappointed father do or a disappointed mom? We, we, we come after them. We, uh, we scold them. We remind them that, they, that, they, that they're very much like their dad. Oh, thank you. Thank you. I knew you were up to no good. And we, we berate them verbally as, as, a, as an expression of our frustration as, or anger because we're so disappointed with Junior or with my daughter, their behavior is not in keeping, is not commensurate with what you taught them or what you want them to be. And when they disappoint you, our children, we are very quick to judge them, very quick to assert a certain level of discipline and verbal expression that, that imprints, it imprints in them. Uh, and so instead of helping a lot of us without wanting, we've damaged our, our, the very essence of the, the people or the kids or the lives that we love the most on, the, on God's green earth. So a lot of us fail and we're in denial because it's too raw. Some of us don't even want to address the area or the, um, the issue of conflict, of, of, of conflict because it's too painful. It's frustrating. It's been debilitating to know that we are utterly, uh, uh, we feel uh, impotent or we feel like failures because we have not succeeded in the past to try and get our relationship where God wants them. Uh, there are four causes for, or roots for dysfunction. The root for, the root causes for dysfunction. Um, let me just address um, a, a Proverbs 37. And uh, Proverbs 17.1. That uh, better is a dry crust eaten, or, or actually it really stale bread, if you will. Uh, when you eat it in peace and quiet, it's better. Stale bread is better than to be in a house filled of feasting where there's celebration uh, but there's strife and conflict. There's strife and conflict. And um, the, because of our fallen natures, uh, uh, most of us um, lean toward trying to pretend like let's celebrate life. Let's go from one party to the next. When the reality, uh, uh, this Proverbs, uh, Solomon is saying that, A, stale bread is better when there's peace um, and there's quiet than a house full of feasts. Uh, and feasting, uh, and filled, of, filled with feasting and strife, but there's strife and conflict. Uh, I'd like for you to see with me what uh, James says up here, if you're able to see it. Yep, so what is causing the quarrels and fights among you? Isn't that a good question? So what, what causes you to strive? 
What causes conflict? Why is there quarreling and why are there fights among us or among especially couples or, or in families? Don't they come from the evil desire that wars within you? In other words, all of us are a fallen creature with fallen natures in a fallen world. And there is strive, strive, strive. There is selfishness after selfish act after selfish act. Most people get married because they're hoping that that woman or that guy is going to make them happy. And instead of going into a relationship knowing or wanting to make the other person happy, that, that God's created me to be Christ-like uh, so that I'm going to engage in this relationship called a marriage, and I'm going to walk in this relationship called a family when God gives us children, uh, and those children are going to hopefully benefit from people uh, that are selfless and not selfish. Verse 2 says you want to, you want to, um, uh, you want what you don't have. You want what you don't have. So you scheme and you kill to get it. And I'm not talking murder of somebody, which it can include, but you kill relationships to get it. You kill the joy. You're a killjoy. Uh, you, you kill like, like trust to get what you want because you're pursuing something uh, that is not directly engaged to a healthy relationship. Um, so you scheme and you kill to get it. You are jealous of what others have. Just think about that. How many of us look at someone else, the Joneses, and you want to be like what somebody else has, their level, uh, their level of prosperity. You want to have a house, a car, a business like somebody else has, but you can't get it so that you fight and you wage war to take it away from them. And yet you don't have what you want because you don't ask God for it. You don't ask God. You go about your own way instead of saying, God, what is it that I need to do? Who is it that I need to be so that I can, at the end of the day, uh, embrace those things, those blessings that you have for me? Um, and verse 3 says, even when you ask, you don't get it because your motives are all wrong. Your motives are selfish motives for self-aggrandizement, for pleasure, to show off so others can be envious, so others can be jealous of you. And that's why we strive. That's why there's conflict. That's why many of our marriages are struggling uh, because uh, either or both people are unable to put their pride aside. And, and if I get there, I'll talk about pride here in short order. Uh, so for the four causes, or at least four, there's a lot of causes, but it, I'm going to kind of encompass them. So when there's anger issues, you, you haven't taken care of, of anger issues. Your dad was not there. Your mom was abusive. You grew up lonely. You were hurt. You were bullied by your siblings. Uh, Etc. all the way down. We're all good of identifying uh, root causes or maybe root excuses for how, how come we behave and why we are. But whenever there's anger and there's aggression and there's uh, shouting, the, raises, the raising of voices uh, in our homes, all of a sudden it's a shouting match. Um, there's contempt. In other words, a sense of, of hatred. That's what contempt is. A negative tension instead of positive tension. Uh, and offensive and insulting words. When you start name calling, man, it is bad. It is bad when you start each other, uh, couple, husband, wife, you start telling or name calling and, and calling your kids names. Um, I know of a, of, a, of a family that I love dearly, that the, the father was very, very strong. He, the, the way he would deflect attention, the way that he would deflect responsibility is he would get very aggressive, very verbal very like intimidating and he would call everybody names his daughters his sons he would call them names and effeminate names and and just to the tragedy of this that's what the son ended up being just just effeminate just ended up like just becoming and making choices with respect to his own nature his own gender his daughters it just it just is an incredible thing how you can speak something and 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 your words have more power than what you know and what you think. They leave an imprint, either for good or for bad. Uh, the power of life and death, the power to shape somebody's future is in your tongue. And when we are angry, when we are bitter, when we get defensive, dad or mom, mister and sister, you and I are the, like the most dangerous people. All over. It doesn't matter that you mean well. It doesn't matter that you have gifts, you have potential. It doesn't matter that you are graced and God, God has favored you with all kinds of, of capacity and, uh, and potential. 
Just, just all of that is, is undermined when there's anger issues, when there's bitterness in your heart, um, when there is aggression and you, you, you share and you speak offensive words. Um, and I'm trying to remember here the code. Um, so root causes number two is when there's chaos. There's, in other words, a lack of order. There's confusion in your home. There's, there's like no sense. You come to the house, you come to the car, the garage, every room, and there's chaos. It, 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 the nature of that is when there's untidiness and uncleanliness, everybody here, if you, once you get used to it, it is not a good sign. It, it is an ma outward manifestation of what's already chaotic inside. Uh, when, when, this, this, when you excuse, I thank God for my wife. I, I thank God for Linda. She, she's not here, but man, she keeps a good home. Um, and you know, I, I'm more of the mindset that, hey, I'm going to sleep in this bed anyway. Why do I need to make it? <laughs> right? Like, and just give me six more hours and I'll be right there. But, but Linda, right, she, she makes the bed. And there I am helping her on the other side and, and making all our kids make their beds before they leave the school. Not every single day, but almost every day. Uh, yesterday, I mean, we, they, our kids finish school, and as a reward, they get to clean the house up and down and everywhere, outside and inside, right? That was their reward. Uh, you know, you want to get fed, huh? Huh? You want to sleep in our, in our roof, huh? So get busy or get out. No, she didn't say that. Uh, I say that, right? Get busy or get out. Uh, that's more in keeping with me. Um, but when there's chaos, confusion, when there's competition, when there's disorder, watch this, undefined roles, undefined, just, just undefined rules, like, like, like there's no rules or there's no limits, there's no order, or sometimes people have rules, 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 and rules without relationship lead to rebellion, so rules without relationship, and, and sometimes when it's all relationship, it's all good, nobody says anything to kind of put anyone in shape or in order, we don't want to offend the child Uh, when it's all relationship and no rules, uh, that person grows up to have a permissive spirit. That person grows up wild. That person will end up in jail and hurting other people because everybody should know their roles. How many say amen? Everybody should understand the importance of rules uh, because rules are there to protect the house. They're there to protect everybody and responsibilities. Uh, third root or cause, root causes Uh, number three is verbal, when there's verbal, mental, emotional, physical, or sexual abuse. Any kind of abuse, even psychological abuse. Neglect is a form of, of abuse. Abandonment is a form of abuse. Um, it's, it's a, maybe sometimes abandonment is, might be worse than somebody being verbally abused. At least I know that that person is present uh, versus, hey, I'm silent. You mean nothing to me. Uh, you're dead to me kind of attitudes that, that we uh, express to our kids or our wife or our husbands. Sometimes wives are, you know, we make mistakes to husbands and the wife takes it so personally that, that the wife, that the, that the husband gets the silent treatment for weeks, for months. Uh, there's still, we still haven't heard from you, sister. Thank you, thank you, sorry. It's like this couple that were giving each other the silent treatment. He goes, he gets home and there's a little note. You know, on the table, it says, your sandwich is in the fridge. So he goes, and uh, so he says, to him, writes her a note, hey, hon, could you help me, you know, uh, you know bring in the mail? And so, so there's, anyway, the notes. So at night, he, he puts a note on her, on her pillow, you know, and it says, please wake me up at 5 o'clock. I have an important meeting at work. Please wake me up at 5 a.m. So he wakes up startled. It's 7 a.m., and there's a little note by the clock, and it says, psst. It's five o'clock. Wake up. Right? Oh, you guys don't understand me. Some of you guys are so, okay. So any kind of abuse, especially I would say verbal, mental, emotional, physical. When there's sexual abuse and you've been, uh, I pray not. But if you've ever been part, uh, either, either um, um, you were proactive, you did the sexual abusing, you, you need help. Uh, if, if you're a per perpetrator, if you're a, if you're a victim, you need help too on both ends. Um, they, they are they're kind of um, uh, just just uh, just they're, they're, that's the kind of abuse, by the way, that if it doesn't get treated on both ends, if it doesn't if you don't get help, 
If you don't express it, if you don't share it, if you don't get counseling, if you don't go to a Christian counselor or a Christian psychologist or psychiatrist, um, you, you need therapy both here at church uh, but, but beyond church. How many say amen to that? How many understand that I'm trying to help you as a pastor embrace? Now watch when there's trust issues as well. So th these are things that undermine relationships, trust issues. When, when you can't trust your, your husband or your wife or your children, there's trust issues. When, when, when things have happened to lead you to believe that there's something happening that's not right, uh, there is, there, that just undermines the, uh, the fabric of that relationship. When there's infidelity, when a man goes to places or in a computer or in your uh, device, um, when, when you're talking women, sisters, when you get into an emotional affair in a, through the, you know, through the social, uh, um, 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 through uh, social media, and then all of a sudden somebody pays attention to you at work because you feel like you're being neglected in the house or in the home. It's just devastating. Trust issues, infidelity, lead to depression, deep scarring, aberrant, uh, and highly destructive behaviors. Highly destructive behaviors. Mostly self-destructive, uh, where somebody begins to engage in drinking or, or in behaviors that, that take their life to a different level and a different end. And then the fourth one is when there's envy. Very dangerous. When you're jealous. Uh, when, when, when jealousy is one of the worst. The Bible says that, that a, a jealous woman or even a jealous man is worse. Is this one of the worst um, environments when, when there's jealousy. Uh, because what it is, it's a root of insecurity. It's a root of insecurity. It's a root where inside the person's hollow. The person's identity is based on, 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 on status, on what people think and say. And that person's hollow in the inside. So somebody that's jealous begins to be disrespectful or name-calling, lying, cheating, and manipulation and deceitful behaviors, other deceit, deceitful behaviors. The Bible calls manipulation the same sin, the same sin as witchcraft. So when somebody engages in manipulative behavior, men that try to, to intimidate with your voice, with your body, with your physical, uh, you know, just, just you begin to raise your voice and you, you threaten or you actually manhandle a son or a daughter or your wife, man, that is the same. You, what you're doing is casting a spell. Uh, you are, it's witchcraft uh, uh, to your family. And, and they'll see you later on. Maybe that moment is gone, come and gone. But if you don't own up to it, if you don't have the courtesy and the courage to say, hey, guys, that's powwow. Uh, your dad made a mistake. I was angry. Um, I was trying to be like Pastor Saul, and I fell really short. And that's what got me angry. Boy, that's not even funny, huh? But I thought it would be, but at least at the moment. But, but that is like, it just bleeds into every other relationship. Your sons and your daughters are going to learn from you. And they're going to become little witches too. <laughs> they're going to become little manipulators también, dad and mom. Mom, when, when you go, because man, everybody knows, ladies, everybody knows you have the power. Everybody. Right? Just, the Bible says that a wise woman builds. But when you engage in manipulative behavior, whatever that may look like, whenever there's austerity, whenever you use your prowess, you're more intelligent, uh, whatever you use, whatever it is to, that you use to manipulate the husband or your kids, whether it's tears, whether it's anger or fake or fiend, um, you know, emotions, or whether just this emotions out of, out of control, you, you, once you burst, you burst. And, and so everybody kind of, even the cat and the dog, they run for their life. Um, so all of that is manipulation. I, I'm taking my time here because I sense, I sense that there's some deep issues here that, that are aberrant behavior, aberrant, that we've kind of normalized. You think it's normal to scream and yell because you might have grown up in a home. I did where my mom was very assertive. She was a strong, she was a woman of God. My mom was a woman of God. My, my mom prayed, and, and God used her to, to bring healing and deliverance. Uh, but she was assertive, and she was a, a, a screamer, a yeller. Uh, my mom had, like, all kinds of moves, uh, physical moves, that uh, still to this day, they, they defy uh, logic. And I'm talking the belt, la chancla, the whatever it was, the broom. Uh, she was, like, uh, like 
kung fu, like, like in like the first level, first belt, uh, black belt in kung fu. Sometimes they would come from every angle. And so that's why I have so many quick movements and uh, dexterity. That's why I've learned. Uh, that's right. Uh, yes, yes, yes. Um, but but my, my, there's, can I share with you a, a, a true experience? So my mom was uh, kind of assertive. She kind of, my dad was passive. Uh, my dad was a, a, a saint in every word, in every sense, faithful. My dad knew who he was. But my, my dad sized my mom's temperament. And my dad says, mm, we, we can't, shouldn't be fighting in front of the kids. So you want control? My dad kind of just said, you got it. You got it. So we grew up, we we're seven, five boys, two girls in our home. And uh, my mom, like I said, woman of God, godly. We would go to church to this day. I'm here today because of my mother. But in many ways, some of the issues that some of my siblings may have myself were probably mostly from her. Um, and um, in the sense that when we grew up, we became teenagers, uh, 18, 19, 20. So we grew up. My, I have a couple of brothers that are taller than I am. And, and so she's like this level and so all the screaming in the world, right, all the intimidating and all, it's, it's all, all of a sudden it stopped. We're no longer afraid of mom. And so how do you handle when you, when you want your sons to be, like, mindful? They're no longer afraid. But you're still a screamer. And, um, you know, I tell my kids that, you know, my mom stopped spanking me when I was in college. I'll let you guess whether that's true or not. And I said, so I'm not going to stop spanking you till you're in college or uh, till the day after you're married. I'm, I'm kidding. I'm being, I'm being facetious. But one day when, when things began to fragment in our home, they really did. Uh, church growing. I mean, going. All of us born again, saved. All of us baptized in the Holy Spirit by God's grace. And yet at home, there was tension. Just tension. So it, it goes to show you, or there's a, a point that I have here that that even best of Christians, even the best Christians, just because you're a Christian doesn't make you immune or exempt to conflict in the home. Just because everybody loves Christ in your home, or you might be all Christian, it doesn't exempt you from, from engaging in destructive behavior if you're not careful. And so my mom went to a convention, and that convention, a woman's convention, God speaks to her. God reveals to her that she's about to lose her kids. I had a couple of brothers or siblings, a sister that were like ready to just say, call it quits, leave early, prematurely, probably to our devastation. Uh, not me because I wasn't that smart, and I'm, I'm, I'm being honest. I was, I was okay. Most of the times that I got rebuked or manhandled, I kind of thought to myself, I deserve it. I got away with so many other things. <laughs> All right. That was the way I reasoned it. Um, but anyway, just, just God works and deals with her. She comes home from a, a convention. And to my surprise and everybody's surprise, she calls my dad and, and all my siblings to, a, to the living room. And she says to my dad, Heriberto, I, I want you to forgive me. Um, I, I usurped your role. I just, I just I didn't want to do it intentionally, but I thought that that's who I was. That's who I was. And I usurped your role, and I took away your, your authority. My, my dad never reacted negatively. Uh, my dad was like above board in every way. In a lot of ways, I thank God for my dad. My, my dad was a, just, just, he kept his eyes to himself. Uh, my dad was a, a true uh, believer in terms of just being faithful to God and to my mom, period, every time. Um, and, and yet, and then she tells all of us, uh, five boys and two girls, Forgive me, she, every one of us. So she comes and hugs us. And she cries on our shoulder. She's like this, and she's crying. She said, perdóname, over and over, perdóname. My words, what I said, if I've spoken and I said like insensitive things, forgive me. And so we just... Like everybody was weeping, and then she goes all the way down to, from Daniel is like, we have an Elijah, we have a Daniel, we have a Lydia, which is a biblical name, Mary Magdalene, uh, we have Ezekiel, all of them are prophets except me, like I'm Saul, like Saul of Tarsus, or, or King Saul, which was a terrible person. 
I don't even know why I got named Saul. I don't know. I don't like the name. Don't name your kid Saul. Unless you do it in honor of me, it's different. Uh, it's different. But right there, right then, God brought healing to our home. It's just, just I mean, I lived in my home till I was 30-something, and it's none of your business how, how much. But I was 30-something. Everybody stayed at home. Everybody until we got married. So Everybody. Would you bow your heads? I know I, 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 just, I, I just feel God's presence, and I want to be sensitive. There's, there's a lot here. But suffice to say that, that just one changed. Just, just the acknowledgement that, okay, I'm, I'm dysfunctional. And maybe because I come from a dysfunctional home myself. So all of us need to be sober. You need to be honest with yourself. It's the first step toward healing is, is not to lie to yourself. Be very, very honest and, and, and be able to identify root causes. What is causing the, the issues? Is it your dad or a missing father, a mother, uh, uh, the way you were raised? And, and today you are probably an expression of your dad. You're probably a, a, a mirror image of your mom, sister. And, and then whatever abuses they tended to do, whatever mistakes that our parents tend to do, our parents did, if we're not careful, we'll go, we'll either overcorrect, we'll go to the other extreme. And so if you were spanked or, or corrected corporally, often you won't touch your kids to your misfortune. You, you won't exercise any kind of discipline, no boundaries, no rules. Why? Because you were, you were oppressed and you were maybe verbally or physically abused. And so parents tend to go to the other extreme or they tend to emulate and imitate our parents. Either way, we are, uh, we are continuing to provoke. We are continuing to exacerbate. We are continuing to promote the same idiosyncrasies, the same brokenness, uh, the same mistakes um, that our parents did, and we are now a reflection of them. Just for a couple of more minutes, I, I beg your indulgence. Just if you can look up the screen here for me. I just want to say there is hope. Everybody say it with me. There is hope. Uh, there is hope. If you've got your notes today, I just want to at least have you write in the notes that there is hope uh, for your family conflicts. There is hope for your family conflicts. Uh, God says, remember or remember that God has the power to restore and make the most of every crisis. That your crisis can be used of God. Your conflict can be used of God for your good and for his glory. For your good and for his glory. Um, so Paul says to the Galatians, don't be deceived. Don't lie to yourself. Don't be in denial. Uh, don't do a head fake to, into your own self. Uh, do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A man or a woman is going to reap what he or she sows. Um, that whosoever sows to the flesh, anger and, and, and divisiveness and dissension and selfishness, whoever sows to the flesh, uh, from the flesh, you will reap destruction. Or there's a verse that says corruption. You'll become corrupt in your own mind, in your own devices, in your own uh, stratagems, the way you behave, the way you comport yourself. Um, but whosoever sows uh, to please the Spirit, to please the Spirit, from the Spirit, you will reap eternal life. So let us not become weary in doing good or the right thing for the proper time. You will reap a harvest if you don't give up. First Peter, I want you just what he says, that, that the God of all grace who called you to his eternal glory in Christ. So, and the God of all grace who called you uh, to his eternal glory in Christ um, after you have suffered a little while uh, will himself restore you and make you strong and firm and steadfast. I want you to embrace this next verse. Let us hold tightly uh, without wavering to the hope we affirm or God can uh, be trusted to keep his promises. For God can be trusted to keep his promises. I'm talking, there is hope. Say it with me, there is hope. Uh, there is hope for your family. Secondly, if, if you got your notes, God can reconnect the pieces. God can put that puzzle uh, together, that labyrinth that, that has brought you so much consternation, confusion, and chaos. God can reconnect the pieces. Here's two undeniable truths I want you to just embrace because these are the fundamental truths, undeniable. The first is that being a sincere and devout Christian does not exempt you uh, from struggling with dysfunctional relationships. Just because you and I are Christians. I grew up in a Christian home. 
And in many ways, in several ways, in several areas, there was dysfunction. There was like chaos. Um, there was, but, but we all were Christians. We all loved God. And yet there was pain or there was moments that, whoa, they were very difficult. But the second one is the most powerful, that Christ has the power to deliver. How many say amen? That, that you are not impotent. You are not a victim. You don't have to stay the same. That Christ has the power to heal you uh, and to restore you and your family to be able to engage and enjoy in healthy, healthy, uh, God-honoring, Christ-building relationships to the glory of God. How many say amen? No success in life can compensate for failure in the home. It's one of my favorite axioms in life. I, I say it over and over. No success. It doesn't matter what what height you reach, what title you have, mister or sister. Uh, it doesn't matter what you become. David had a crown, and he was, he was basically a giant slayer, but at home he was miserable. He lost his kids and his daughters. There was incest in King David's home because no success in life can compensate when you're a failure as a father or as a mother or you fall short uh, to kind of bridge the gap of the dysfunctions, the chaos, the pain, or, or sometimes the, the reality that... Uh, that is in our homes, a lot of times we are the perpetrators uh, behind that reality. Our, our sons and daughters kind of stay away from some of us. And, and, and they might be already adult, but, and, and, and I'm, I'm being very sincere. Because something about your personality, mom or dad, something about the way you are, the way you be, the way you do things is, is just like an anathema. Just, you're like hovering or whatever it is. Um, but, but I just, I want to, I just, I want just, 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 this is no success in life can compensate for failure in the home. So God is a God of order. How many say amen? So he's a God of first things, first God. He is a first things, first God. So he's a God of order. Uh, four or five years ago, I told our staff that I was praying about where to go next with this church. And then God spoke to me and says, saw the the, the most spiritual thing you could ever do, the most spiritual thing. I thought he was going to say, pray more, fast more, read more. But he says, uh, get organized. Get organized. It's the most spiritual thing you could do is to get organized. So God says, seek ye first or seek first the kingdom of God. Um, sh swallow your pride and humble yourself. So he's a God of order. So swallow your pride and humble yourself. If you want healing, if you want healing for your family, uh, swallow, put away your pride and humble yourself. Uh, God gives grace and favor to those who are humble. Uh, and all of you, dress yourself in humility as you relate to one another. For God opposes the proud, but he gives grace. He promotes the humble. I'm just going to get to point three and own it. Own your failures. Own, take responsibility for your shortcomings. Uh, David did. He's, he acknowledged his transgressions and his failure and his shortcomings. Uh, God is the ultimate fixer-upper. No matter how messed up you are, no matter how broken, God can put your pieces together again. How many say amen? God can put Humpty Dumpty, you dummy. I mean Humpty Dumpty, uh, you dummy, all together again. God can take your dumb past expressions, your biggest mistakes, and God can use it for his glory. How do we know that? He says, for, all, for we know that God causes everything to work together. How many say amen? Everything, even our worst mistakes, even our worst tragedy, uh, uh, tragedies, even our worst acts, together he will put them and he work them, the tapestry, put them together, uh, and he will make it work for your benefit, for his glory, for your good, and your benefit. And then number three, I just want you to write this down in your notes. Choose love and forgiveness. Choose to love others and forgive. Choose to love unconditionally and forgive everyone. In the prayer, our prayer, uh, Jesus teaches the disciples to say, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses. Give, forgive us our sins to the same measure, the same degree and proportionate manner as we forgive those that have sinned against us, that have hurt us, that have offended us, that have, uh, that are debtors. Forgive us. This is powerful. This is, uh, and then he finishes in verse 14, Matthew chapter 6, verse 14. For if you uh, don't forgive those who have trespassed against you, if you don't forgive those who have sinned against you, your heavenly Father will not forgive you your sins. 
or your trespasses. And that is so heavy that sometimes the only thing waiting, that God is waiting for you, is to forgive those that have trespassed, that have hurt, that have offended you, that have abused you, that you hold in contempt, that you don't like. You need to let them go, and you need to forgive them. Now bow your heads. Now, now let's finish uh, this. Um, so, Father, we just pray. I just sense that um, there's so many of us that you're working something special, something different. You're making us own it, holding us responsible. There's an act of humility that we need. We need to humble ourselves, pick up that phone, make a call, powwow with your family. Let somebody go in your heart. Let somebody release that person. Pray for that person that hurt you, that offend you. Uh, bless that person. Pray for that person or those persons. Stop complaining. Stop competing. Stop comparing yourself with others. And, and uh, allow yourself to see your wife or your husband the way God sees him. Not perfect. Not perfect, but forgiven, redeemed, worth dying for. So if, if your husband and your wife and you were worth dying for at Calvary, then, you, then, then your husband and your wife are worth forgiving. Because if you want God to forgive you, uh, you need to forgive others, and especially our spouses. Hallelujah. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Let's give the Lord a clap offering. Help me. Amen and amen and amen. It's so powerful, so awesome when worship just touches your heart and when the Word of God challenges you to just go to the next level in your walk, your faith, and communion with God. Thank you for being with us. Another presentation of Lifehouse to Your House, and I pray to your heart. And now I pray that you pray about giving, about sowing to this ministry, this ministry that God has called to lead thousands of people to know God, grow together, and go serve. This ministry that is serving our communities, that are our ministry in a ways that, that we are serving the indigent, the lost, the broken, the homeless, and your gifts uh, make this ministry go farther, and I thank you for that. Also, would you pray about just joining our team of people that connect us with other people through the different platforms of social media, Facebook, uh, YouTube, Instagram. Would you help us by following us uh, by clicking and then also by sharing these messages. Please do that. When you do that, you help propagate the gospel. And then lastly, uh, look at our Church Center app. Would you download this la Church Center app? Um, it is something that is a wonder. It is a, a technological wonder. It connects you to what LifeHouse is doing in our communities and how you can come and visit us or have others visit as well. So as you move forward, remember that God is for you. And if God is for you, who can be against you? Here at LifeHouse, we're for you. God is for you. And thank you for praying for this ministry. And thank you for being part of a ministry that God is using to lead thousands of people to know God, grow together, and go serve. God bless you. We'll see you next time.